top headlines. I mean, I've been seeing so much stuff on my timeline. I'm curious to kind of hear what you guys have been seeing all over your timeline. But if y'all remember last week, it was a pretty eventful week when we had the uh, one of the deaths <laughs> from Mavia. And my, my man was fired the fuck up. He was litty. He was like, I don't give a shit what people are saying. And, Brad, it went on after that. And, and, and I'm really curious to kind of see what you guys have to say about this because we were talking about how you, you guys were helping me understand like how you define like oh the numbers are botted and this and that their token doesn't seem to be reflecting none of that bro like these guys have been non-stop straight to the moon like what is the story over here like uh, maybe these numbers are legit i mean it's right so right off the bat most most of the online platforms i'd say not even just strictly to gaming you know i mean there are bots that exist that's just part of this whole entire ecosystem out here right and so to, you know, to accuse them of being like, oh, well, you know, you're, you're botting your stuff. It's like, all right, well, I mean, like, everyone is. So, like, to what degree, though, you know? Um, because that's where it kind of starts to get into that gray area of, like, well, is it affecting the types of investments you're raising? Is it affecting the following you're getting, the token price, things like that, because it's so inflated? Or is it just, you know, steady growth? And, like, there's, you know, some fluff in there. But, again, that's that's normal, you know? I, uh, <laughs> I, I think that, um, you know... That particular company, I'm keeping my eyes on. You know, uh, I'm I'm kind of watching them from a distance. I'm not really getting involved in that at all. Um, I've spoken to a lot of different devs and founders over the years now in this space, and like, you know, there's just there are some things that I'm a little weary of. You know, um, you know, I'm not gonna fud anything here. You know, but like at the end of the day, um, it's always super important to do your own research and make sure that you know. Don't be afraid to ask hard questions to founders, to developers, to anybody that's involved with the project. You know, I mean, don't, you know, just because somebody might say like, oh, why would you ask something like that? You know, it's like, well, don't, uh, you know, ask the hard questions because even if you don't get an accurate response, you know, judging people's reactions is kind of a big tell for me when it comes to any project. Yeah, I mean, you know, just to add on to that botting point, to you know, take a look at their token, take a look at their active player bases, take a look at what's happening with the guilds within the game itself, um, you know, and their engagement on social media. Um, I, if it is botted, I think it's very limited botting. Um, I think if there is botting happening, I, it's happening primarily on you know uh, a lot of. Uh, you know, the, uh, um, you know, mobile gamers from developing regions that are maybe trying to farm in-game tokens and setting up botnets for that. Uh, but when it comes down to the actual project, I have not seen a hell of a lot of evidence that would lead me to believe that they're, you know, doing anything malicious within this space. Uh, having said that, though, Bread Bites, you did say everyone bots to a certain degree, and I'd love to hear from the other speakers, because uh, at least that's not our history. <laughs> Yeah, maybe, Real quick, maybe I, I just be clear with the yeah. bots, though. Like, like you said, like the botnets. You know what I mean? Like those paying, you know, villages overseas, you know, dollars a day to go ahead and you know, yeah, yeah. That's that's more. But, so um, the unfortunately, bots. there's. I mean, like, you know, that's not something I would point to the project, right? You know, I think when projects hit a, a big reach uh, internationally here, there's just, this is an inevitability of the eco economics behind the project as of a whole. You know, it, it's, it's, it, it's interesting. I don't think that the... Um, I don't think the Mavia team has much to have to, you know, uh, uh, put up with in terms of FUD. I think their results are speaking for themselves. Um, and I think the way that they've been growing their community has been really, really good. I did see Kearney, though, uh, give me tons of thumbs down when I was trying to vote for Mavia a little bit. So uh, go ahead. Tell me how I'm wrong, brother. Yeah, Colin, I love you, man. But uh, you're, you're very, very, very off on that point. It is uh, majority bots from what I heard. It was over 90% at a moment, at a time when they announced the 1 million active users on the platform. Um, I'm in the number one North American guild, or in the US, my apologies. So I have a general understanding of how many players are playing, and especially with someone, you know, I previously was in Clash of Clans, and it's impossible to find people your rank uh, currently. I'm like Town Hall 5. So it, it's pretty obvious that it is botted. I think the issue that everyone had was they were announcing false statistics that did lead to pump in the token price, uh, including, you'll notice, if, uh, if you keep an eye on who they're using to promote the token, and I am here to FUD, uh, they used um, you know the Wolf of All Streets, they used a handful of other pump and dumpers. Like There's certain names I see on a project, and I, I'm, I'm watching out, man. I'll tell you that. I'm watching out. 
And and don't get me wrong, I think the gameplay is fun. I think it has potential. Obviously, it's just like Clash of Clans. I think they're going to deviate from that and add in some new features. And I'm overall bullish on the game. Uh, but yes, I had a huge issue with how they came out discussing uh, statistics. And now they're starting to promote how they're advertising to the mass market, which I'm very bullish on. So I'm pretty neutral right now. But uh, yeah, it, it was some rough, it's rough bumps in the road to start out. That's yeah, that's really interesting. My head's down. We've just been building infrastructure here. Um, you know, as someone with a classic plans uh, background here and has experience in you know mobile gaming experiences, how were you able to differentiate between you know bot farms and bot nets and you know actual real players playing these uh, mobile games? Yeah, there's 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 analytical sites, uh, and and I actually I speak to Jonah a lot, Jonah Blake in his uh, Discord, and he was dropping all the statistics. Uh, from data AI and uh, from what I saw uh, in China, especially, they, they didn't even have the game available on their main uh, app store. So that's just one of the, you know, the red flags that I saw when they're boasting about number one in the Chinese store. And Grail.eth mentioned to Jonah and he shared with us saying, yeah, it's not in China. Uh, this game isn't really playable there. So that, that seemed to be a red flag to me. Um, but however, uh, you know, it's still the gameplay is fun. It, the game is fun. I'm bullish on that. So, you know what? We got to start from there. All right. I'd like to retract my entire first statement then. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, guys, let's try something new this time, right? If we're going to raise hands, then the person, whenever you're done talking, go j just call on the next person whose hand it is. Like, we're going to be all grown up in here today. We're going to try this out and see how this shit works. We're going to revolutionize Twitter spaces today. New Jedi. We're adults. <laughs> <laughs> where it's oh yeah, but man. that's it. But but then Cullen comes into the mix, so like, watch out for Cullen. He's kind of like the the bonzo. new Jedi. What's up, bro? What's up? What's up? All for Web Three. I just want first of all, I just want to say because I don't, if, don't know if anybody knows in this community, but Wolf Web Three, he is on Spaces twenty four seven, twenty five eight, and he comes to a lot of the UK Spaces, and and so first and foremost. Love to you, bro, for the graft and work that you put in and actually the energy you're spending in other spaces. So I wanted to reciprocate. Um, so I take, I take a, a, maybe a, a different approach to this. I've been in esports and gaming in the conventional space for about eight years. So it's a little bit of a different. So I run some very, very large festivals, ran big esports gaming events. So I understand the metrics, the MAUs, the DAUs, the things that matter. And I think whenever I think about um, monthly active users and daily active users what, what i'm actually looking for is not just peaks right because this web3 space is hyper, hyper light speed i'm looking for sustainability and i'm looking for ongoing longevity and i'm actually i'm not i'm not also not buying the bullshit of of, of so uh, so-called knowledge leaders or grifters or shillers or anybody really that's in this space to try and make a quick buck and think that i'm their exit liquidity I want to see and understand kind of the team behind the, the game. And so, I mean, when I hear a million MAU, I mean, my pants drop down. Like, I'm excited. I'm like, wow, what a, what an opportunity. Um, and actually in the mobile space, it's not, it's, it's not atypical to see crazy peaks and then crazy, crazy pitfalls. Um, but, but, but certainly the Mavia story uh, and actually Wolf Web 3, like we spoke about this a little bit on the UK spaces and it, and it seems to have looked quite good. Um, Obviously, the, the, the controversy based on the most recent uh, comments is it's it's a bunch of horseshit. So I'm certainly going to take some time to look into it in a bit more detail. But but yeah, uh, uh, somebody that is I'm actively talking to gaming publishers, um, and you know the strength of, of of talking to conventional gaming publishers and calling NFT soulbound tokens is winning hearts and minds like you wouldn't believe because there is this idea that really the friction and, and um, the concern is around the tradability. I don't even know if that's a word. I'm coining it this evening. The, the idea that you can trade the token, that's the thing that terrifies and worries big conventional gaming publishers the most in their own spaces. So I'm certainly having to build bridges uh, to kind of bring um, more education and, and conversation uh, alive. But yeah, these are the types of spaces I live for. Uh, and uh, it's, it's kind of nice that it's nice to be involved with people that all like gaming. And maybe I'm like anybody in this space. I am gaming whilst we talk. Um, so next thing is I'm going to do, I was going to say, I'm going to do a knock, knock joke. That's such a dad humor. And give it to knock to be the next speaker because that's what Wolf Web 3 asked me to do. All right, bless everyone. Not uh, unaccustomed to those jokes. Don't worry, I've made a few myself. 
Um, I, I want to bring up a, a couple of things that I think are pretty interesting uh, regarding Mavia specifically. I think, like, pretty objectively, if you look at the total volume on that token, there, there's something here, right? You don't just do $100 million in 24-hour volume off of 90% bots, right? There's something to be said for the interest within Mavia. As it pertains to DAU, I, I actually released an article back in December um, talking specifically about the way that team sort of report DAU and how you can have a wide range of actually reported numbers based off of purely just the way that you choose to report daily actives. And that doesn't necessarily mean you're lying. The example that I'll give here is a game that has 10,000 people that are participating in a particular activity, right? 10,000 wallets connect to the game that you're working with. Game one reports all 10,000 wallets as 10,000 DAU. You had 10,000 people connect to the site, therefore we have 10,000 users. That is a valid way of reporting DAU. Game two only reports the users who, one, connect, and two, perform some form of game action. This is what most of us think of as a true DAU. Not only have we connected, but we've performed an action. They only report 7,500 wallets, right? It's the same 10,000 pool. They're just reporting it differently. Neither of those two teams are really being deceitful in the way that they're reporting it. It's just two different paths of doing so. The third team, and this is very common, especially in the mobile space, the third team reports all sessions from those 10,000 wallets. So if a wallet connects twice, that's two users. That team is now reporting 12,000 daily active users from the same 10,000 pool. So now you have three different reported daily active user measurements None of them are really lying. They're just reporting the metrics differently. And I think that that's an important piece of context here. Is it possible that a team has a million daily active users or a million monthly active users? Absolutely. The level of strength of those daily active users is completely besides the point. And I think that that's where a lot of people get confused when you're talking about metrics like DAU and MAU. How teams are reporting it, the severity in which that they are fudging with the numbers, all of that is relevant when you're talking about metrics in the space. And it's really hard to call anybody a liar because everybody reports this differently anyway. It's something to pay attention to. The one hard fact that we do have is that there is a $100 million of 24-hour volume in this particular token. To me, that signals it's very unlikely that this is bots. Kayla, you're up. Oh, wow. Very adult of you. Thank you. Uh, so, so I think that... There's a big misconception when people talk about who is and who's not botting their spaces because from my experience at these very big gaming companies, when I've been able to see behind the curtains, they are using a level of this. And it might not always be that they're fully botting their spaces like they bought the bots, but a lot of times they own the bots. It's very easy to have a Python bot, for example, go follow all of the people that might like your game. Um, so there, there's like this gray area where these people exist and they're doing their job and then um, there's this area where it's like really obvious and it's inorganic and their metrics don't add up. So I just wanted to give some insight because you can look at engagement and specifically with um, the fact that we've got a check mark here on Twitter, everyone complained about that and it's annoying, but it's a result of the fact that there are bots and we've got to prove that we are a real human now. And so I think there's, um, you have to start, we have to start looking at the actual engagement and not the numbers. Uh, I've, I've yet to see a lot of people be like, oh, well, their engagement is, you know, 3%, 4%. But in advertising on the other side, like, I can immediately tell if something's botted because their engagement's like 0.07. Come on, Kayla, don't break the chain. Right, you got to call got the next you. person. I Red. got you. Oh, thanks, Kayla. Appreciate that. Um, well, I think it's important to note with volume, right? And I don't know how much this exists in traditional gaming, mobile gaming, you know, outside of Web3. But I know personally through experience with several different teams right out here that there's a lot of fake volume that exists in Web3. You know, there's a lot of projects that specifically fund anonymous wallets to trade back and forth between each other to get the volume up above 100 ETH within 24 hours. And now you're trending on Icy Tools and Rarity Sniper. And then you get, you know, you get larger spread and then they see that volume and everybody rushes in because of the FOMO. Right. And now again, I have nothing to prove that any of these games are doing that, but just know that in web three, that's definitely a problem that exists rampantly. So, you know, is the hundred million in 24 hours 
authentic? Like maybe. I mean, I'm I'm not here to say it's not, but just again, do research. Everyone should be doing research and really don't ever take anything at straight up face value in this industry. Uh, let's see who was next. I think it was. Uh, we'll go to Thorfy. <laughs> okay, I definitely wasn't next, but I thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, we, I think another thing we have to realize is just the personal motives behind these projects. Um, you know, when we're talking about wash trading and fake volume and things like that, you know, that's far more applicable for m more niche projects with a very niche appeal to a niche community. Um, when we're dealing with projects that have the level of targets that Mavia has, I think it would be really, really foolish and short-sighted for them to even contemplate wash trading and funding a bunch of you know, soft accounts and soft wallets in order to you know, increase the volume. It's just, you know, there's enough people looking at them. There's enough people like, you know, Austin Kearney and other guys out there that are looking for the truth. Um, and so, you know, it, it just seems kind of productive and uh, really short-sighted for a team that's seen this level of success in our space, uh, you know, stoop to a level uh, that low. And unfortunately, real quick before we go to the next one, like, unfortunately, though, it happens in this industry all the way up to the VC level. You know, there's VCs out here that are working in tandem and pumping projects behind the scenes, you know. For uh, sure. Like, but, I mean, like, you know, it, it, I wouldn't necessarily consider that wash trading, right? Because you have a third party that has a vested interest within that project, and that third party can utilize their capital however they see. Um, I'm talking more specifically when you have teams behind, you know, as you were saying, funding brand new soft wallets, trying to pump up their volume. Um, you know, it, it, it is... With everything being fungible, it is very easy to track where these wallets are being funded from. And so unless these projects are actively using mixers where it's impossible for us to gauge where the initial source of liquidity comes from, um, I, I, I just find it very unlikely that a team with the level of notoriety, with the level of spotlight, with the level of targets on their back like Mavia would be, you know, shooting themselves from a legitimacy stance uh, in their foot, um, you know, as they just come out of the gate running. Damn you, Colin. Damn you, Colin. Call on that next person. It was actually Bowling. Oh, Bowling shit. Bowling. I forgot Bowling. the old rule. All right. I forgot our old rule. Jesus Christ. I'm so sorry. Go ahead, DeFi Kingdoms. <laughs> hey, hey, thank you. Uh, yeah. I mean, the reality is unique active wallets is a subpar metric. Uh, you know, it's the best we've got, but it's just not a good metric. Um, and you also have to take into account what platform you're looking at. So, you know, I'm going to use DeFi Kingdoms as an example. You know, not only are we a game, but we're a full DeFi protocol. So we also have, you know, especially because we run our own subnet where we have our own decks, we also have our bots, uh, a lot of them. And so, you know, you also have to account for, for our bot transactions. Like there, there's a lot of things that go into it. Uh, and then, you know, it's less prevalent in mobile gaming, but on, you know, if, if you're not a mobile game, uh, you know, multi-walleting, also a factor that you, you know, have to account for. And so, like, I'll just say that me personally, I look at a unique active wallet count, whether it's DeFi Kingdoms or, or any other projects, and I just divide it by three. That That's my outlook at this point, is whatever you say your unique active wallets are, or even if it's not you, like, we don't we don't publish our own, we, we just refer people to Dapp Radar because... It's the, you know, trusted source. Uh, you know, I look at Dapp Radar, I divide by three. And I figure that accounts for multi-walleting, our bots, uh, you know, any potential fudging of numbers. Uh, you know, you if you just look at that number and go, yeah, that's probably about right. It, I feel like it takes more than that to, to really get there. Uh, and I look forward to the day that we have better ways in Web3 to track actual player counts. But the reality is we just don't right now. Unique Active Wallets is the best we have. But it's not great. Uh, and so, yeah, I think it's really important that people also, you know, look at the platform, look at what it offers, look at what it runs on, and then make those determinations as to, you know, what that, that dividing number should be. Marco. Uh, DeFi Kingdom, you're too kind. What a gentleman. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, Brad, I'm not one of those people that pumps the, uh, the token. I'm just putting that out there. It's not my style. Um, it, great topic. Um, but uh, and maybe it's me. Um, but DAU, I always look at DAU to a certain degree as a vanity metric. Um, and maybe it's too soon for this particular project. Um, and I don't know if anyone's got any insights. But I'd be far more interested in the retention rate and in the ASL. And if we don't have the retention rate, do we know the churn rate? 
they are more the metrics that tells me the validity of the game from a um, from a gamer stroke user perspective rather than the DAU. Does anyone have any insights into that? If not, uh, I'll go to Nock. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that the, something that we sort of abstract away when we're talking about metrics is like we, we fight over what a superior metric is for for tracking a particular growth metric or whatever it might be. I think the reality of the situation is there are plenty of valid reasons why one team might value a specific metric over another. You know, you look at games in the traditional space, you can have two very different games with two very different player counts. One game's got a million players, each of those players spend a dollar a month. One game's got a hundred thousand players, each of those players spend ten dollars a month. They're effectively making the exact same amount of money on a monthly basis, their player counts are widely different. By the logic of a lot of the traditional Web3 folk, we would be looking at one of those teams as superior to the other simply because they have more players. I don't think that that matters. I also think it's really difficult to grill a team like Mavia or any team that is seeing rapid growth over the course of a 30 or 60 day period and say, hey, what are your 120 or 90 day or 120 day reta uh, like retention metrics? They don't know the answer to that yet because they're having a boom. They're having a moment. They're having the breakout that you would expect a game like recently with Power World, they're having a breakout month. They're having an opportunity or something that might not be sustainable growth long term, but we still don't know what retention will look like on a game like that. We also don't know how much money the users within that game are actually spending. I think arguing about metrics in a game that is in like a 30 day to a 45 day period where they're in the process of breaking out, it's still very unclear whether or not users are spending. It's even more unclear whether or not those users are here for the long term. It's really difficult to say they're not reporting the right metrics, their daily active user counts are botted, yada, 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 because we don't know for sure what's actually happening under the hood. The one metric that we do know for sure, and then you can look for on-chain, is that their token is sitting at a near $2 billion valuation. They're doing significant volume on the token. It is worlds ahead of what most other gaming tokens are doing within the space. And that, at least from a Web3 perspective, is a pretty strong metric for level of interest. That doesn't mean people are playing the game. It doesn't mean people will continue to play the game. What it means is, Mavia has played the Web3 game well. They have acquired enough interest in this space to see significant volume on their token. That's pretty impactful in and of itself because it's something that most teams in the Web3 space never even achieved to begin with. Marco, back to you. Thanks, Nock, because uh, I'm coming back to you with a slight challenge. But maybe it's not a challenge. Uh, maybe it's more of a question. Is the, when you say about the metrics um, too soon, is this a Web3 thing? Because I would challenge you and say in Web2, they know the metrics out of the gate from day one. And I'm invested into Web2 games, so I, I see the data. So is it, is it a Web3 thing? Um, uh, hey, I'll just put it out there. I'll go back to you, Nock, because I asked it of you. Yeah, so I, I think that there's a couple ways to answer your question. In part, yes. Um, when you're looking at traditional game studios, let's talk about teams like Supercell, right? Massive mobile market studio. They really understand metrics. They know what works, what doesn't work. They know when they have a hit on their hands. They've got four hits that most of us have heard. Clash of Clans, Clash Royale, Boom Beach, Heyday. They've also sunset 22 titles, right? They've killed more games than they've delivered. And they've killed those games because based off of the information that they've acquired from the games that are successful, they have determined, hey, based off of the 30-day here, relative to what we've seen in our successful titles, this is not a game that has legs. We'll give it another 30, 60 days. We'll sunset it. It's not something that is worth our time and effort. They've even killed profitable games based off of the metrics relative to something like Clash of Clans. In the traditional space, that makes sense. There's a, a series of data. It's very easy to understand if you're an experienced dev what you should be looking for. In Web3, you've got another layer of abstraction there. Not only are you trying to account for what makes sense from like a player perspective, and you're trying to understand retention da data and retention metrics based off of a net new studio releasing your first title, you really don't have anything to compare it against. So you're already behind from that aspect. 
you factor in Web3 and Web3 user counts and, and unique active wallets and all sorts of metrics that don't really make any sense, um, even for like the most experienced of teams in the space, it's really difficult for a new studio building in Web3 to, one, act with the same level of really intent that you would see in the traditional Web2 market from experienced studios, but they've also got another layer of data that is really hard to parse, it's harder to understand, it's really difficult to know whether or not a unique active wallet is one person, or is it five people, or is it vice versa, right? I think it is a Web3 problem because you've got new teams shipping new titles, never really had the experience, they don't have anything to compare it to, and you're layering Web3 on top of that, it's an absolute nightmare for most people to navigate. Doesn't it depend Doesn't it depend on how Web3 the game is, though? Right? At the end of the day, like, it's, uh... I mean, it does, there's, there's token economics you have to worry about because it's obviously all publicly listed, like, token prices and volume and everything you can actually see that a a normal Web2 game wouldn't have to produce, right? You wouldn't be able to just look at the back-end metrics and see the numbers of, like, daily or monthly or weekly active users or anything like that. You wouldn't be able to know any about this stuff. Like, you'd, the company would actually have to release that data for you or anybody to actually see it. But with Web3, you got this token. You can see how much money is being spent and traded on that token, the price going up, and there's no way to, like, hide those numbers, um, like you were saying, there's people that are investing in that the the token that there's no way to like put that behind some privacy wall. So in theory, Web three kind of exposes more. So you can, in theory, you could actually be Web two game developers and work off of stats you've had in the past and build a pretty good game in terms of like what you're saying retention and user acquisition and things like that. But the Web3 components, the outlier information that makes things a little bit wily, and in theory, you could control demand because of this Web3 application in this case where bots are, are a way, and I don't want to call, it a, call them a marketing tool because they're not, but in, in this case, they could be leveraged to uh, make it look like things are being more successful than they really are, and it's kind of like a you know, hey, here's a window into our analytics um, that we're not going to give you access to the behind the behind closed doors analytics. But look, look at the token; it's doing so well. You know, look at this; it's doing so well. It's kind of like for the untrained eye, validating a game that might not have validation because they can't really see the metrics from behind because most companies aren't going to show those metrics. God damn it, Lucas. We had such a good thing going. I know you wanted to throw the point in there. No, I'm not trying to hate. I'm just trying to say, like, Web3 actually is a good thing and a bad thing. It's a bad thing because you can manipulate things, and then the public can see you, like, the numbers going up, and you can, like, leverage it to your advantage. And it's a bad thing because you're going to get less users because more people that try to, you know, figure out Web3, they're going to be like, oh, I don't want to take take part in this game because it's fucking Web3, and you're going to get less people wanting to take part because it's Web3, because it's NFTs, because there's so many negative attributes associated with it and all these like game influencers on YouTube and on Instagram hate Web3 right. and NFTs. You know, that's what I'm saying. So I got you. I got you. Look, I want to get to the I want to get to the rest of the hands. Shaolin, I know you've been waiting for a minute and then when you're done, obviously pass it forward. Yeah, for sure. So this is super interesting for me, right? Like I'm front facing, I'm community facing. And, you know, I do have a, a data analytics background, but I haven't really utilized it, you know, outside of some of the social media. And so to hear all of this is really impactful to me, trying to better understand, you know, we're in play test uh, over at DLab Games, where I'm the community manager. And, you know, um, this stuff is super intriguing, because I'm also understanding the DeFi components of it, you know, with tokens and stuff like that. So this is... Um, really compelling stuff. So shout out to the conversation. It's really challenging uh, me to get a better grasp of what's going on, but I think it's very compelling information because it shows the value of where things go. Um, to kind of deep dive into this a little bit more deeply, you know, I think I'm trying to better understand like how you even really evaluate the metrics given to, you know, what Nock has said, which is if games and the interest doesn't even, you know, sustain more than two to three months and people are already sunsetting things. It's kind of intriguing to better understand, like outside of, again, daily active user, monthly active users, like where the stuff kind of lands. And then if you tie in the tokenomics of it, uh, uh, you know, of 
a game when it comes to you know dropping a TGE. It's like so some other layer, and so it becomes. I don't know if it becomes diluted in terms of like where things land or if it, it, where it's at. And so I feel like my question to, I guess, the panel too is like, how does one get really a better understanding of it? Because I feel like we kind of just jumped on the deep end and I'm like, I didn't know if I was supposed to jump in. Feet first, head first. I only know is I'm upside down. But that being said, this is a very interesting topic and I'm really here for it because, you know, it, it sounds like we also have a little bit of interest um, from investors do you know who are under these games? And obviously th those metrics mean a lot, but you know, in the end of the day on the opposite end, does this stuff really matter to like effectively evaluate a game and gamers as you build? Cause I still think as you go through play tests and you look to, you know, really build um, <clears throat> from the inside out as a develop, you know, development team, you're really trying to get traction, a hold of people who actually are interested in the game itself. And if you're so focused on the metrics, you know, does that just taper off and, and just change the whole dynamic of what we're trying to do, which is actually build fun games. So I know I, I touched on a whole bunch of things and I guess I'll pa pass it to Kearney um, since he's been waiting also. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I, I think the only thing I can state, and I actually had to double check this, what I mentioned earlier when Gra Grail.eth mentioned um, when Mavia posted about being number one on the Chinese Google Play Store on the free app section, that that Google Play Store in China is actually banned, and and they don't have access to it. So it's it, it again, maybe I am wrong on the percentage of bots. We don't have to go back to that that whole argument, but it is it is a genuine red flag to see a boast about something that is banned on. Um, in a, in a certain country. So I'll leave it at that, but I think, I think this has been a, been a great combo. I'll throw it over to, well, uh, to knock. Can I just oh, jump bad, in Marco. very quick? Got it. No, 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 no. I didn't have my hand up, but I just want to jump in quickly um, for that clarification. So I was in China at the weekend and I looked it up on the Chinese gaming sites. And to your point, Kearney, I did not see it listed anywhere in China. Yeah, no, I appreciate the the double check on the sourcing. <laughs> Thanks, Marco. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, I mean, I think metrics are like such a it's such a contested thing because everybody is trying to sort of force their opinion in one way or another what metrics matter and what don't. I think ultimately, when you're looking at a game and you're looking at a Web three game specifically, you know, in theory, what we should be caring about is is this game generating revenue and is their token being traded or are their assets being traded? Now, even that, in my opinion, is, is a relatively weak marker for whether or not the team is having success or the, the game studio is doing well, because I think that there's just so much that we still don't have at this stage of the game. In a very net new ecosystem, most of these teams are just coming online in a playable version of a game that is not really what is meant to be the live state. These teams are probably 12 months plus out from really having a product that they're proud of, that they want to be. This is the game. This is when we'll begin to push things. In the case of Mavia, it seems like they're a little bit further ahead than in the process than some of these other studios. But I really think it's difficult to deep dive into whether or not DAU metric is relevant when everybody reports it differently. I think it's difficult to deep dive into whether or not we care about unique active wallets because you're not really de-doubling those wallets. Here, <laughs> they're, they're wallets. I could I control five, six, ten wallets. Am I ten people or am I mad, right? And I think that that's something that we're not really measuring or solving for in the Web3 space. The metric, at least in my opinion, that we should be caring about is whether or not these teams see extended and, and uh, extended success, right? Mavia is having a hot moment. Are they still relevant in six to 12 months? We don't know the answer to that yet. What we can discern is the fact that they're doing volume on, on the token. And I know I sound like I, I'm just, you know, a broken record here, but I do think it's an important metric that we should be looking at. They're doing volume on their token. They're doing volume on their NFT collection. People seem to be playing the game. Just because it's not something that we expected or not something that we necessarily had visibility on doesn't mean that it's not legitimate. And it also doesn't mean that they're going to be successful six months down the line. This, to me, feels like a Mavi is having a moment. Let's see if they continue to have that moment over the course of 24. Uh, we'll go, I think it was Kayla. Thank you. So, yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, secondly, 
I want to point out, for example, Clayton Blockchain is Kakao Gaming Company. So I think a lot of people don't realize that this is market research for those bigger companies. So like Kakao came in and they opened Clayton, you know, Blockchain, and they're doing a ton of games in Web3 now for market research. So 100% what somebody said about, you know, not knowing the metrics because the metrics are six wallets. And the, the, what they're doing, though, is... They want the bots sometimes, not Clayton specifically, but these big gaming companies, they want the bots to come in and they want them to get a million impressions because I think Brad said this, that then allows there to be an organic peak and what they do is they collect the data and they run a sentiment analysis on it and then they've got that data to bring to their Web2 gaming market. So um, this is market research for the Web2 games and I think that's why we don't see as much of the turmoil and uh, you know, turbulent things happening in Web 2 is because this is market research for Web 2 games. Web 3 is the wires we're hiding. <laughs> and so, like, it's all one thing. Um, we separate it here because we're working on it. But the people don't know that. <laughs> Real quick, before you go, Kayla, I just want to say what's up to Rudo. Rudo, what's good, bro? We instituted a new system, Rudo. You see how well it's working? Everybody puts their hands up, and then the one person calls on the next speaker. Like, the speaker calls on the next speaker. It's incredible, bro. So I didn't want to break the chain, but I just want to say what's up. So if you want to throw your take in here, I know that uh, maybe you kind of will wild card it for uh, <laughs> for today. What's up, Bruno? How are you, dude? I love the I love the new system. Um, I'm usually a big proponent of absolute unorganized chaos, but I think this is uh, a lot more fluid. So yeah, this is great. My my take is I have a bit of a background of in traditional digital marketing, so I've worked a ton in performance marketing and and um media buying and stuff like that so i've i've handled budgets of like you know seven figures or eight figures sometimes and i will tell you this okay when it comes to metrics analytics and stuff like that what in web 2 and web 3 it's all very similar the game hasn't changed when it comes to either botting or getting fake impressions or fake likes or fake users like all these things have been around for a very, very long time. And people, the reason why people go down this route is so that you can skew the metrics so that you can use that as leverage to onboard even more either users, consumers, or whatever it is. So I don't think this is going to change. And if anything, I think the whole debacle with like Mavia and how that went down, that's only just, I think that's foreshadowing for what it's going to be like um, in the in the near and even long term future, to be honest, like and anyone who thinks that that's not going to happen, um, it, you got to keep looking at more data because it it's going to that has always been an issue and it will always be an issue because data is king and data is leverage and if you're able to fake it or even make it organic, there's not much of a difference to to most people. Um, so yeah, that's my take on it. Choose the next speaker, Rudo. Oh, shit, I forgot we do that. Okay. Um, see, but now I feel like I'll get flooded if I don't choose the right person. I I'm going to go to NFT Drew only because I think he joined in the same time I did. Um, and I'm sorry if he's cutting the line here, but, you know, Rudo has spoken. Go for it, Drew. Okay. Yeah, I was just, just going to comment, too, on the kind of the metric portion. You know, I think something that's super interesting, obviously, depending on the game as well, is, you know, kind of early on when... Uh, if you remember, Fortnite kind of introduced, uh, you know, kind of um, equal level matching, and then they introduced a bunch of their own bots. Like, when everyone first started out, you join a lobby, and then it's nothing but bots. Like, they're all just running into trees and into the wall. Like, if you, you know, I, we all get, you know, people use bots, but if it's also stuff like that, I mean, come on, that, that's not a way to grow organically by any means other than on paper. And I think a super important metric, especially when I do a lot of, like, looking at seed funding or other, other games, especially in Web3, like asking for specific analytics of yes, unique wallet ownership, yes, unique time. Like, what's the length uh, on individual wallet, uh, individual users slash wallets, or uh, what's the average that you're at actually spending in game, and then also a geolocation map of where this game is being accessed from. I asked for that one time, and I was provided that, or they showed me um, actually on a call live. So like, yeah, we have that data, and then ninety nine percent were from Bangalore, India. So you know that says a lot. A lot there and that was a very quick call um but i think those are some of the really important things that you know a lot of people just don't know and for a lot of the stuff i mean a lot of people don't even know the right questions to ask right especially when you're looking at it from this standpoint to try to delineate you know what's true what's not because this is probably just an area that a lot of people are just growing into 
it's maybe not something that a lot of people are looking into from a Web2 perspective because they didn't have the access or the visibility into it because now we're talking about everything being decentralized. Come on now, Drew. You can't, you, you want the responsibility. You, you go speak. You got to take the responsibility. Dun, dun, uh, I actually wasn't paying attention. My phone's in my pocket. So let's go to, I feel like uh, the Shailen was right. right uh, no, I'm, I know. I spoke, but I can pass it back to Doug. Um, but I, what I wanted to ask real quickly, uh, too, is, is there, there all right, and I'm, I'm from the digital marketing space, too. Is there, like, an AMA or a CTIA that does govern, like, some of these metrics and what the standardization is, or am I just missing something? I, does gaming have that, and is that going to be passed over to Web3? Does anyone know? Dude, do uh, you mean, like, just a platform where you can get, like, user data? Well, not just user data, but, you know, like when we talk about, you know, digital marketing impressions and stuff like that, I mean, there's a, a standardization of understanding. There's not like five different ways to explain it, right? It's pretty on par, whether I go to agency route or if I go, you know, um, from from whatever, right, in, in digital marketing, like it's understood. There's not too much misunderstanding. Earlier, we were talking about like, oh, it could be like five different ways to interpret uh, these metrics. And I'm kind of like, is there a level of standardization? Do we expect there to be? Um, that has got crossed over from Web 2 to Web 3? If, if I can, um, the, the short answer, and I know I'm hopping the line here, the short answer is no. Um, and, and this is because there, there's a variety of totally valid ways to report the same metric. We did this exercise about DAU a little bit earlier in the space, but you know, most often teams are reporting metrics in a way that is relevant to their stakeholders and to their shareholders, right? I want something reported this way, therefore that's the way that we are going to report that metric. It doesn't make it less valid, it just requires the consumer or somebody who's looking at that data to do a little bit of understanding in terms of what's actually going on under the hood. It's unlikely that we ever see standardization in the traditional gaming space. Um, add Web3 to that, and it's even less likely, in, in my opinion. Um, sorry to cut you off, but Doug, I think you were up next. Wait, I was trying to go last so that I could copy everyone else's answers and like you know, write them down in my notebook, Rudo and Wolf. This is not fair. Do you say I have to like try to form my own opinion? Wait, how many people are in this room right now listening to me? All right, hold on. Um, whatever Kearney says, I agree with him. Whatever Lucas says, I just agree with him. That's pretty much how it goes. Um, also, um, you know, man, there's a million different topics going on right here, okay? The key here is that Web3 Gaming is about all the things that everyone's talking about, right? Um, all these top stories, whatever. But in reality, things are always changing, right? The next big thing, the next whatever. So just do that. Just do the next big thing. Like, do something good. Uh, put out a game that's great. Nifty Island put out a game that freaked people out and said it's cool. Will it last forever? I don't know. If they continue to innovate, they will. I mean, I I literally spend all day tearing my hair out trying to think of creative, new, innovative ideas um, for content, videos, gaming, whatever. Um, I'm also very excited about the new thing launching tomorrow, which is like gaming so far that I can't talk about because it's top secret NDA. But um, yeah. I had to jump into the space because I think I'm normally on this show and I'm like required contractually to say some kind of opinion wolf. Um, is that, I think we wrote that in blood or something somewhere. Is that true? <laughs> Doug, how you going to make us the stepchild fucking gaming space, bro? Let me tell you something, by the way. Carney came up in here tonight and said that he's part, of, unless you guys are part of the same guild, he said he's part of the number one guild when it comes to... Um, uh, <laughs> when it comes to, to Mavia, and I was like, wait a minute, Doug said last week that he was... I'm in, like, the number two guild or something, or maybe we're number one in the United States. I'm in, obviously, La, uh, the guild two. with Jesus. Number let me two. check, I'll tell you. Yeah, Hold on, let me tell two, you. Number two ain't number one, Doug. Number two ain't number one. I might be number one now. Let me go check. I gotta check my official... Go read the, yeah, that's go read the contract. That's cap. <laughs> <laughs> go read I'm the looking, I'm opening... Now you rug? Unbelievable. It's convenient. Very yeah. convenient rug. Yeah. Bolin, go for it, bro. Uh, swear. <laughs> go for it, Bolin. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, while, while Doug is MIA. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to, to circle back on, like, the metrics and tracking thing real quick. And not, like, it goes so much farther than DAUs. And that's where I think that, you know, to 
uh, Knox point, like having standardization is probably not going to happen, at least not in the short term, uh, if ever. But, you know, even if you look at like the major tracking sites outside of DAP radar and look at like coin market cap and coin gecko, uh, you know, those are the sites that a lot of people use to track tokens themselves. Right. But even they don't measure tokens the same way as one another. Uh, when it comes to like the metrics, not the pricing, but the actual like token itself and the supply. And then also you run into the never ending problem of this is a highly innovative space and things change very, very rapidly. And so, you know, expecting everybody to constantly keep up with that, it's just not going to happen. Uh, so, you know, we even ran into it with coin market cap and coin gecko of, you know, we had to make a decision on how we wanted to to track some stuff because curve introduced a model where your users voluntarily time lock their tokens. Well, are those tokens circulating or are they not circulating? Well, that's up to you whether they're circulating or not circulating. They're technically in the player's hands, but the player has, or I'm going to, sorry, game. Uh, They're in the user's hands, but, you know, the user has now voluntarily time locked them. So there's just so many things that can go into every metric for Web3, whether it's a Web3 game or not, uh, but even more so on a Web3 game, that, you know, no platforms are standardized. And because of how fast things evolve, new techniques come out, new technology comes out, it, you know, it would be almost impossible to even have a standard at this point. Like, it, it would have to be pretty drastically slowed down to have a standard that actually got kept amongst a variety of third-party websites who aren't getting paid to update their, their website because Curve put out a new technology. Uh, so I think it'll be something that, you know, maybe we see in the long run, but at least in the short term. I, I think it would be almost impossible to have just in Web3 in general. Uh, and I will bounce it back to Doug, who claims to be back. We'll find out. I am ranked now our guild ranked fifth. I don't know what happens. Probably because I'm too busy working to play games, Kearney. Did you say so, fifth? Yeah, fifth. Oh, I'm taking it back. I'm bouncing it to somebody else. You you promised number Doug, one. Doug, what are you implying here? Come on now. I'm implying, Kearney, that you understand that we work hard and we don't have time to do things like play games, silly games. You know what I'm saying? Kearney, if you don't go to Colin right now, he might blow a gasket. I'm just letting you know. I know, like, he's I was been... just going to come off mute. I was just going to come off mute, bro. Oh, that's... I was just going to, I was going to force my way in no matter what, no matter if anyone picked my hand. Um, yeah, I, I mean, like, on the data, the data analytics side, I might be a little bit different from everyone else here. Um, I don't particularly see an absolute huge value with arguing over which forms of analytics in our absolutely infancy industry Web3 gaming is. Um, I don't think that's particularly valuable. Um, I think we we need to look more priority uh, at growth metrics. We need to be looking at the way that we're onboarding Web2 users. And I think one thing that everyone can agree on here is the way that Mavia is onboarding Web2 users into a Web3 climate. That is uh, really, really valuable to our industry from a macro perspective. Um, at the end of the day, I think these metrics are going to change. We may have DeFi Llama you know, type products that come out that try to standardize these metrics. Uh, but at, you know, uh, with our industry not being, you know, Web2 gaming, not having the legitimacy and the solidification uh, over the establishment of the Web2 gaming industry, um, we need to be focusing on our core metrics, and our core metrics are growth and growth and onboarding Web2 users into Web3. If we continue to try to rely on an ever-dwindling Web3 community, uh, our industry is going to die as a whole. We need to be looking outside, and, uh, you know, metrics help, but, you know, growth metrics are by far the thing I'm most, most interested in. <sighs> Oh, I can keep talking if you'd like. <laughs> no, I, you, you gotta choose someone. You, for, you forgot the finale. I forgot my. Own, I forgot the rule. All right, uh, go ahead, Marco. Thank you, Colin. And uh, first of all, I just want to say, uh, uh, Rito, you uh, uh, the first thing that you said did disorganize chaos. I think you need to take a leaf out of uh, Wolfstock. Um, he spends a lot of time now in the British spaces, so he's obviously got a bit of class and etiquette. So I'm liking this new style, Wolf. Good, good move. Um, I just, I, I, yeah, and Colin, you're right. You, I, I agree wholeheartedly with you, apart from just uh, one thing. I think, and of course, this. I'll preface this by saying it depends on which side of the fence that you sit on. Of course, 
And to Shailen, to your point, you know, in Web2, we typically have about 12 metrics. So there is a framework. So there are about 12 metrics um, that we tend to look at. Not that we look at all of them, of course, because as I said, it depends which side of the fence you're on. If you're in marketing and PR, some of those metrics um, are what I would deem as an investor vanity metrics. But I think for Web3, um, and it struck me with regards to Mavia, there are probably two key metrics that I would look for every single time, and I do when I'm being pitched games, is the ASL, so the average session length, um, and I'll come to why I think that's really important, and then because it's Web3 and the, and the, the, the tokenomics, how it tends to work, is what is the revenue per user? So they were probably the two key metrics. And the reason why I say the average session length, and I've been thinking about this with Mavia, we've got all these users, but and we talk about you know whether they're uh, multi wallets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But also, are people just logging into the game because of the airdrop? And I don't know, but I wonder if that comes into play because it's almost like. We're trying to probably compare apples with apples, but actually it's probably apples with lemons because of the way that the tokenomics works in Web3 as opposed to Web2. Kenny. Yeah, no, I think you had a great point there. The longevity of the game is going to be based on the competitions and the side of things where they, you know, the guilds are competing against each other. And that's really going to drive token price. We've already seen it previously. So I'm really curious to see it. I wanted to comment on something Colin, uh, Colin mentioned earlier. The, the onboarding experience for Mavia was one for all mobile games to take note of. You don't even know it's Web3. You don't know anything that's going on. You make an account. It, 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 there's an SDK that generates a key and seed phrase for you on, the, on their back end. And then, bam, you, you're in. It, it was super easy. So... I am extremely, extremely excited to see how the competitions end up, you know, in the tournaments and all clan wars, whatever they end up doing, similar to Clash of Clans, ends up, which could be, you know, a major, major user uh, driver. Because at the end of the day, a lot of gamers, you know, a lot of comp, you know, especially in the esports industry, you know, they, they want to be able to make money on a, on a game and, and have fun doing it. So I'm, I'm curious to see how that plays out. And it's one to watch. Colin, I, I know you muted, unmuted. Uh, I'll give the mic back to you. Oh, no, I, I, I had nothing really to add. I actually want to just uh, unmute here and uh, give a big support to Marco uh, for his average session time length uh, metric. I do think that that, along with growth, are some of the most powerful metrics that actually give a really good indication on you know the gameplay experiences and the gameplay loops, um, which at least would give you trends to see um, you know how likely you are to have a lot of returning users. Oh, and uh, and uh, Gnock here. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, uh, I'm not saying this to push back because I actually agree with Marco. I do think average ses session length is an important metric. I'm bringing this up because I, I want to just paint a little bit of a picture of the, the theme that we're talking about, right, where metrics can be interpreted differently. Average session length historically has been used as a metric for the overall health of a game, i.e., how long do my players play when they log in? That metric is inherently flawed when you're talking about mobile games that are designed for bite-sized actions and bite-sized activity. If you're playing a game like Clash of Clans, you might log in, you might check your camps, you might make an attack, you've logged out within two to three minutes. If I'm playing a game of League of Legends, I might play for 40 minutes. Does that mean that my League of Legends experience or League of Legends is 12 times as healthy as Clash of Clans? Absolutely not. I think it's another metric, just in a sea of metrics, that you really need to understand the context behind what is being reported, right? And even with average ses session lengths, you'll have some teams report the total length played over the course of a day versus the individual session length to sort of make up for that gap, right? So in a game like Mavia, a two to three minute session length is probably fine. But in a game like Valorant or Fortnite, that's absolutely fucking terrible. <laughs> you haven't even logged into the game. In Fortnite, you haven't even left the bus. You're already at a two to three minute session length, right? So it's another example of how 
frivolous sometimes metrics can be when you're talking about game and what actually really matters when you're looking at data and metrics behind the health of a game is the context in which those metrics are reported right on mavia you have a game that is designed to be played in short bursts it's designed to be played frequently over the course of the day because you've got timers and things that you need to come back to the base and make sure that you're doing this sort of thing whereas in a game like league of legends it's designed for you to go there sit down rage four minutes into a game because you've already known you lost and then spend the next 28 minutes crying about your team that's the way that league of legends is set up right so i do think the context in which data is reported is the ultimate defining factor in whether or not somebody is healthy there are zero healthy minutes spent in league of legends just to be clear i play it every day and i fucking hate the game so <laughs> oh, yeah you can't play it otherwise <laughs> Dude, do you even play League of Legends unless you absolutely hate it also? No, you can't. It, I love you, you try and then you hate it because you played. I tried, and you know what's funny? I try to play League of Legends like to wind down before bed, and then I end up just rage quitting and not going to sleep anymore because I'm just furious yeah, at like, my jungle for failing his job. Never do that. Sorry, I fucked up the the like the the smoothness of this space. So I'm just gonna pass it over to Charlie. Go for it, Charlie. Yo, what's up? Okay, I guess you know we're all talking about like analytics. I feel like maybe there's some like unspoken analytics here. Like, so I don't know like much about like the data analytics side for games and you know what what people will look at. But what about like goodwill and Twitch? So my thought was, is like, you're looking at internal metrics about these games and like internal metrics can one be like faked and deceived as far as like downloads, reviews, all those things. But what about like Twitch streams, like people who are actively playing these games? I feel like it's an external metric. And while maybe it's not like the viewership might not be as strong, but it, it should seem like it's an extremely telling metric on general interest around the game. And I feel like general interest is a lot more... Uh, like, it, it's a better metric overall than downloads, reviews, all those things. Because really, like, long -term, like it seems like long-term for a game or lifespan, like, it, initially, you get a good thing by faking downloads, faking reviews. You get to the top of the thing, you get that initial, like, conduct with people, you know, joining onto your game. But, like, long-term playership, and I've talked to Rudo about this before, it's like, I feel like the base question is, is the game addictive? Like, do you want to play it again? And whether it's Web3 or, or anything, and it feels like those type of, like, is it addictive questions lean into, like, are people playing it on Twitch? Is there high viewership? Are people interested in the game? Are people talking about the game? And I realize they're not as analytics-oriented, but do you guys think that that type of metric system, in some ways, is maybe convoluted, but a lot more honest and actually giving you like proper representation about the desire for a game in small and large scale just gonna jump in because i've got two, two seconds here to say what i want to say um yes um and i think more than anything it really indicates the level of growth that the game and the industry is experiencing um to me uh that is by far the biggest most important metric uh, as our industry is still very much in its infancy phase got it okay doug over to you give it to us Wait, hold on. How dare you? I'm the one that's supposed to make the jokes that don't fit into the equation, all right? Um, okay, so um, I would, I'm only raising my hand because I never got to choose somebody to raise to choose. And also, Knock over there is, I think, one of the top three smartest people in Web3 Gaming, if not the entire planet. So I'd like to pass it to Knock, please. Too kind, Doug. Um, so I I'm actually going to address... Charlie's point, and, and I do think it's a valid question. Um, I also think it's not entirely accurate to say that viewership on Twitch correlates to the revenue and the interest in a level of game. I think when you're looking at a site like Twitch specifically, you have to remember a couple of things. Naturally, given the fact that it is a live streaming site, the overwhelming majority of titles that are topping the charts on Twitch are PC native games, right? You abstract that away, you look at the fact that the overwhelming majority of users on Twitch are based in Western markets, and now you're not only disregarding the largest player base on Earth, which is Asia, you're also disregarding the largest and most common platform for games on Earth, which is mobile. If you look at a chart of the top 10 most watched 
Twitch games by hours watched in 2023, and you compare that with a top 10 chart of highest grossing video games of 2023, there is almost no overlap at all between the, the games that are making the most money, or at least bringing in the most revenue, and the games that are watched most. I think when you're talking about PC, maybe there's some validity in the fact that is this game something that is watchable? Does it have some staying power? The other thing that you really need to understand is that by nature of live streaming, games that are multiplayer first, games that are live service games, will tend to have the highest viewership numbers over the course of the year, regardless of whether or not there was a single player game that was highly anticipated or people were excited about. So you look at something like Hogwarts Legacy or Baldur's Gate as an example. These are games that you play through, you compete, you complete the campaign, top Twitch streamers were streaming it for a good two to three weeks, people realize this is literally what they do for a job. They finish 100 hours of content in 100 hours of real-life time. They never stream that game again. Does that mean that there was no interest in Hogwarts Legacy? Or does it mean that there is more replayability and, and viewership entertainment value in a game like League of Legends or Valorant or Grand Theft Auto or Fortnite, where I can play 100 games a day, have vastly different experiences each time, and provide a much more entertaining you know, experience for my viewers? For me, it's the latter. Right. Um, I love Twitch. I was director of talent at Sword Gaming. I managed well over 100 content creators and professional esports players, all of them streaming on Twitch. It is a really powerful tool. I also think it's, generally speaking, a pretty poor indicator for whether or not a game is popular. I guess back to Doug. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go we're gonna close out with Doug. Uh, oh, good. Down. Thank God, I finally have something good to say. <laughs> Go for it, though. And it's only because of Knock. It's only because Knock's really smart. He was smart enough to know that I am currently the coolest um, streamer on Twitch. I started streaming on Twitch, like, last week just to, like, jump in and try it out. Because I've streamed on um, Xenon in the past, which was a Web3's version of Twitch, and I love that platform because, obviously, it's Web3-based. But it, I got to meet so many really amazing Web3 content creators and streamers there. Friendships, people that support each other like crazy. It was amazing. So then I was like, okay, after becoming the number one streamer on Xenon and crushing everybody there with my hearts and love and hugs, then I'm like, let's jump into Twitch when it makes sense, you know, when I have time to do it right and to, to try to really give it a good, a good go. So I jumped in. It went awesome. And all of a sudden, all these people that are my friends that, um, you know, I hang out on their Twitch channels and support them. They come on, raid me. They come hang out with me. And next thing you know, it's my first Twitch stream ever. I've got like 100 to 200 people in there at all times. It was blew my mind. I was like, this is beautiful. All the gamers here, they, if you give them fun, enjoyment, and friendship, they want to hang out with you. They want to support you. They want to jump in and play the games you're playing. I started playing a bunch of different Web3 games. Um, BR1, Cornucopias, Big Time, and people would just jump into the Discord and start playing with me. It was so cool. And um, people I didn't even know started raiding me. If you go out to places like Twitch and we start to actually give a damn about people other than ourselves and support other people even outside of Web3, people that are gamers, people that are out there working their butts off, it's going to come back to you in droves. And they're going to want to support you and listen to what you're talking about. And Twitch is an amazing place for discoverability. It's an amazing place to see the current trends and what's going on, what people are into, or even change the trend. So I love that Knock brought, brought it up because, you know, looking at stats and everything is great. And you can do a lot of things to support stuff. But at the same time, we need to do more to get out there and to game and to connect with people about what they really actually care about, not just like numbers, finance stuff, or whatever. And um, I feel like there's a huge opportunity right now for us to like, you know, have this emergence of Web 2 and Web 3 going on. So I implore everybody to go do this stuff. Um, in fact, I even grabbed a bunch of like Web 3 content creators and KOLs to come stream with me. People that have never really streamed before in a serious way. I had like, you know, Misty Crypto, Blonde Broker with me, Ashley Deacon, where they're like, like hanging out gaming with me and stuff, right? And I found out that they're all gamers. They love, I mean, freaking Blonde Broker is, her, her boyfriend's a pro gamer. She plays Call of Duty all day long. And she's like, hell yeah, I want to do this. This is amazing. She's like, I've been waiting to game. There's a whole avalanche. There's a wall up. There's a damn wall damning the water and just let to pull out the little goddamn plug and let all the gamers come out and play. You know what I'm saying? So that's my message, Wolf. 
is that there's a lot of cool stuff on the horizon if you get off your butt and go and do it. So now I'm going to call on Wolf. Let's go, Doug. I love how you close out the show. Good stuff. Um, one th two things. One, um, Taco, I cannot believe that you did not come up in this show because this whole system was designed around you, Taco. You were the inspiration for this entire show, but it's all right. Yo, great takes from everybody today. This was one of the, like, we're getting better and better each week. I, I, I kid you not. Um, Carney, thanks for coming through. Obviously, knock like amazing takes. Let's see who won MVP this week. Uh, stay tuned for the audiogram when it comes out after this. And uh, yeah, appreciate all you guys, man. Come back next week. See y'all later. Peace.